Well, I'm super excited to talk to you today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things that are make me so happy that I want to run through the screen back here. Uh, what I'm going to look at today causes risings of praise and worship. You know, I once uh, read from John Piper. He says, to the degree your praise is without feeling, you diminish the one that you praise. What he's trying to say is that when you look upon Christ, you begin to see the wonderful nature and character and goodness that he is, that it causes a response that says, blessed be the name of the Lord. C.S. Lewis once wrote an article, and he was speaking about how praise is the commencement of enjoyment. And he uses an illustration of a cup of tea. You take that cup of tea, you put it up to your mouth, you drink it, the flavor bursts on your tongue, you swallow it, it's warm going down on the inside, and you say, oh, that's good tea. You're praising what you just enjoyed. And so to meditate upon the goodness of God, his great nature, his wonderful name, that taste causes a response called praise. It makes the soul say, blessed be the name of the Lord. How often have you read a psalm? David begins to recount how everything is terrible, and then he starts to talk about how great God is, and then he ends in praise. <laughs> well, that's what I want to do uh, today. I'm going to rattle off so many scriptures today that we'll just not turn because we'll be turning the entire time. Anybody know the word lovely? <laughs> have you ever looked up the definition of the word lovely? It means exciting love. It excites love on the inside of you. God is altogether lovely. He excites love on the inside of the heart. A man who has no love for God has not seen God. He who loves God has seen God. He who looks much loves much. Seeing God and what he's like is the essence of what worship is and praise is. As a quote from T. Austin Sparks, he says, A day came when I saw Jesus Christ and everything else appeared to me to be nonsense. Yeah. There's a sight so bright of the man Christ Jesus that causes you to lose sight of every other thing. It is uh, likened to the priests in the temple. The glory of God would fill the temple and they couldn't see anything but the glory. So it is with meditations upon God. You begin to see his goodness and his nature, his glory, and he blinds you to every other lesser thing. There's a quote from Jonathan Edwards that I love so much, and it's what, the, what I want to talk to you about today. It's the reason why I'm here today. Jonathan Edwards writes, it is the beauty of Christ that bows the will and draws the heart. Hey, listen, just, just say that with me for a minute so you can really grab a hold of what he's saying. Say, the beauty of Christ, it bows the will, and it draws the heart. So if, if we're going to look upon the beauty of God, these two things will happen. You will automatically bow, and your heart will be drawn in love. This is what we mean when we say, Jesus, you're beautiful. What, do we, what are we saying? Are we saying that like when he was walking around on the earth, all the girls were like, he must be the son of God. Look how beautiful he is. It's not that. It is not a physical appearance. It is, I mean, obviously we know God has lights and colors shooting out of him that we've never seen, and he is absolutely beautiful. But it's more than just this outward glorious radiance and resplendence. It is a goodness of character and nature that wins the heart. It's kindness it is love. It is selflessness. It is compassion. These attributes are the stars of his charms that the Holy Spirit casts with both hands to cause you to begin to say, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. I worship you. You are good, and there is no one like you. So three things, I believe, will help us see the, the beauty that bows the will and draws the heart. Number one, it is what he is. Two, what he's like, and three, what he has done. I uh, seek the Lord as you seek the Lord. We go into our rooms, and we get quiet before the Lord, yeah? 
For me, the thing that causes direct connection with the Lord through worship is remembering these things. What he is. What he is like. And what he has done. So that's what I want to look at today. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to rattle off a bunch of scriptures. Uh, Listen to this definition of idolatry from A.W. Tozer. He said, idolatry is entertaining thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. Oh, my God. (laughs) So we want to let the scriptures give us our thoughts of God so that we don't enter into idolatry (laughs) and start trying to make God like us. (laughs) Praise God. Uh, Art Katz once wrote, the deceased prophet, he said, is not the root of all of our ills the failure to radically apprehend God as he is? You say, Eric, what what does that even mean? All the problems of mankind go back to one main issue. They don't know God. And so today we're going to jump into these things and just go with me. If I start jumping or something, let's just fix our eyes upon what the Bible has told us about our God. It's going to cause something to happen. Maybe you're in a situation right now, you need trust to build up on the inside of you. Listen to the the word and let trust rise up and let doubt fall off. Praise God. Maybe you're lacking in your love for the Lord. Listen to these words and let love be excited on the inside of you by the sight of God. Praise God. I wrote this poem down. The right side of God brings man low in worship. It lifts him high in praise. It bends his knee in prayer. It opens his hands in trust. It grins his faith with joy-filled satisfaction. It lays him in peaceful sleep. It brightens his eyes with gratitude. It melts his heart with love. It dashes his heart with conviction. It shudders his knees with fear. It humbles him to the dust. It makes obedience a delight, sorrow, passing, and persecution. Beautiful. Praise God to see God as he is. So let's take a look at God and his self-disclosure. How many of you know that this book right here that you hold in your hands is God's self-disclosure? What he wants you to know about him is written right here, black and white, so that you could bring it into your eyes and train your mind and cause your heart to begin to love and adore the Lord. A couple of things that we see in the scriptures revealed about God is this. So, His name is what he is and what he's like. You notice the names of the Lord are connected to things that he does, manifestations of his character. The Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah Rapha, the one who heals us. You see all, Sidkenu, the the salvation, righteousness, you know. So you, you have all these attributes of what God is like being made manifest in what he does that shows you his name. So when you say the name of the Lord, you are saying he has shown me that he is like this by doing that. So when you say the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they are saved, it means I remember what my God has said about himself and how he manifested that in my life or in the past. And I put my trust there and I hide there. Praise God. That's the name of the Lord. So so different things we see. Great are you, Lord, and great is your name, David says. David is saying, look, you are so vast and glorious in how you have revealed yourself and how I have seen you. It causes me to see that you are incomparable. The Bible tells us he calculates the dust of the earth and he weighs the mountains. We don't have mountains in Florida. You have mountains here. This makes sense to you. (laughs) Did you hear that? He calculates the dust of the earth. If I go in my office right now at home and I go probably to the top of the shelf and I go like this, there's going to be dust on my figure. He knows every ounce of dust in the entire planet. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us about how vastly omniscient he is. Omniscient meaning he has all knowledge. He, he knows everything. And it says here that he spread out the heavens all alone. He didn't need any help. He did this himself. It says that he sits above the circle of the heavens. It says that he blows upon men and they wither to nothing. He clears the heavens with an exhale, the Bible says. And he can breathe out and all these majestic angels disappear. I mean, if you look at even the book of Revelation, you see these creatures that come out. Um, not, not just the ones that are in heaven, but the ones that will come to the earth. Even like you look at... I mean, if you really want to get into it, Abaddon, you look at this, this 
demon-like creature of death that is massive coming out in the book of Revelation, it, the Bible shows you that Jesus can blow. God from heaven, just blow, the guy's gone. The, the scripture says that there's an angel that puts a, a foot on the sea and a foot on land and he holds a little book in his hand. He's, he's so massive. If you saw him, you'd pee your pants and probably pass out. And still the Lord breathes out and he's gone. There is nothing that can compare to the greatness of God. We see that he clears the heavens with an exhale. He made the stars, those heavenly flames. He counts their numbers, knows their names, as the hymn says. Praise God. And by his power, not one of them goes missing. He never gets tired, the scripture says. He sets up a king, and then he puts another one down. Praise God. <laughs> we don't have to worry. Yes, we act and yes, we move in accordance with righteousness, but God is the one who puts one up and he puts one down. Nothing gets over on the Lord. It's not like, oh goodness, I didn't see that coming. I did this, the Lord says. Did you know that one of the judgments against a wicked country is giving them a wicked ruler in the scriptures? All, all this to say, God is perfectly in control. Nothing is taking him by surprise. The scriptures show us this clearly. The Bible shows us that the nations are meaningless before the Lord like one drop in a bucket. These are exact scriptures. Like a drop in a bucket. That's what the nations are. You think about two nations fighting against each other and how big, that, how much money's involved, how many uh, weapons are involved, how much destruction's gonna be involved, how much fear would be involved. They're a drop in the bucket to God. Does that make sense to you? The greatness of, of God. He humbles himself, the scripture says in Psalm 145. God humbles himself to look upon the heavens. L listen to what I just said. He's so great that to give attention to what's going on in the heavens is an act of humility. That's incredible. Not only this, but the scripture says not only does he look upon the heavens, he even looks down upon the earth. Even more humility. And then it goes even further and it says, he doesn't just look in the heavens, he doesn't just look at the earth, he looks at the lowly of the earth. What an amazing being are we talking about when we talk about God. The scriptures show us that he establishes the world by his wisdom, he stretched out the heavens by his understanding, he speaks and there's a quote, tumult in the heavens. He makes lightning for the rain and the wind he stores in storehouses. He tells the snow when to fall to the earth. He surrounds himself with lightning and the sound of it declares his presence. He hangs the earth on nothing. He rebukes the sea and it becomes dry. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. Those are all scriptures. That's not poetry written by some great poet. That is actually descriptions. God moved men to write so that we would know what he's like. Praise God. All scripture, yes, God breathed, but also holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Those are things God has said. They got to know this about me. I make lightning for the rain. Praise God. They got to know this about me. I hang the earth on nothing. I break all their rules of chemistry and geometry. None of these things apply to me. God is beyond all of these things. <laughs> what, kind of a, what kind of a person is this? Praise God. You know, there's, I have debates with my friends sometimes. To, to, and and we, we all have different opinions on different things. But there's a, two common streams of thought. One of them is that God is mechanically involved in things, and the other one that God is personally involved in things. Mechanically involved would be like God has just kind of set things in motion, then just kind of throws them and they go, and he doesn't pay attention to them because the laws work by themselves. But then there's another stream of thought that says he's personally involved, which means he is so vastly intellectually uh, uh, capable that he loses no bandwidth whatsoever, no matter how many things you give to him. In other words, he can watch every leaf and every twig, and every bird, and every cow, and every lion, and every baby, every breath, every heartbeat. He can watch all of this with full attention without losing any bandwidth whatsoever, being personally involved in everything that's going on. I like the second one. <laughs> and if it is that way, which it seems to be this way, praise God, because David says he knit me in my mother's womb. <laughs> Not just David, you. Praise God. It says he knows when you sit down and you rise up. 
He's personally involved and interested in your life and he loses no bandwidth in it. He's so outside of time that he can give attention to you as if you're the only being there is. Praise God. He hangs the earth on nothing. What a statement. He hangs the earth on nothing. He's personally involved. The scripture says that he fills the heavens and the earth. He doesn't, he doesn't just declare things before they happen. He declares the end from the beginning. Praise God. None can deliver out of his hand. His purposes cannot be thwarted. Job says his purposes cannot be thwarted. No one can reverse the things that he has done. Isaiah's last prophecy uh, that, that, that he says of God, he speaks and he says that God will come and everyone shall bow down before him. We see here that he calls himself the first and the last. He goes on a rant in Isaiah and he says this, who is like me? Let him recount it to me. Can he describe to me the beginning? Can he tell me the things that are coming for the events that have not yet taken place? Who is there who thinks that he is my equal? Is there any God besides me? Is there any other rock or solid foundation? I know of one, God says. And in Isaiah 45, he says nine times, who can be compared to what I am? Praise God. Man, maybe God wants to grab our understanding of him and bring it a little bit higher. Maybe God wants to expand our trust in what he is and what he's able to do. Praise God. That first point that I have for you today is the first part of his beauty is what he is. It causes worship. It causes praise. Who can counsel him? To whom can you liken him? Can you find his equal? This creates worship. He tells us that, listen to this. He tells us that he is the potter and men are his clay. This is the Bible. He's the potter. Men are his. What, 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 does the, what, does, what right does the clay have to say to the potter for me like this? This is what Paul says. He's trying to expand their understanding and their, their, their faith and their, to see what he's like. To see what we're talking about when we say God. He goes on, Paul goes on to say, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. Inscrutable, he, you can't, his ways are past finding out. That's why trust is the only thing that is logical. Trying to figure things out. It's actually trying to pry into things you were never meant to pry into. Remember when the, the, the disciples say, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, it is not for you to know these things. The Holy Ghost is coming. That's what should have your attention. Give your attention to the presence of the Spirit. Not knowing what's going to happen when. Those things are for me to know. See, for... The scripture tells us who has known the mind of the Lord, who can be his counselor, for he is, who, who can give a gift to him? Listen to this. Who can give a gift to him that it might be repaid? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory. I make an appeal to you. So you're like, what, what's going on right now? He's describing the greatness of God, all things coming from him, going to him, through him, the greatness of his unsearchable wisdom and glory. And his conclusion is this. I make an appeal to you by the mercies of God. Present your body to him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable act of worship. Th that makes so much more sense when you put it together with its context. We always start with chapter 12, verse 1. I, I, you know, I I'm, I'm asking you to present your bodies as a, a living. But what happens before that with no chapter break is an exaltation of the greatness of God. So in view of this great being, give him your body. In view of this great being, this is what worship is. Lay down on that altar and say, forever yours, Lord. Praise God. What he's like is what I'm talking about. He's unmatched. He's unparalleled. There's nothing too difficult for him. The scripture says he makes rough places smooth. He shatters doors of bronze. He cuts through iron bars. My God. Jesus. Four more things I want to say to you. And I, if, if I could recommend anything to you, I would memorize these four passages of scripture and keep them in your heart all the time. It will cause peace to just settle in your heart. One, the scripture says, <laughs> okay, <laughs> now <laughs> just let the word tell you 
about God. A lot of times we have this eisegesis. If you know what that means, it means you're looking into the scriptures to try to find uh, support for what you think. Exegesis is let God tell you how to think. And, And so don't look at the scriptures trying to find what proves your thoughts of God. Look at the scriptures so that the scriptures form what you think of God. Okay? It says all things are his servants. If we believe that, that all things are his servants, it would be so simple to just actually trust the Lord no matter what happens. All things are his servants. Number two, he sits in the heavens and does whatever it is that he pleases. These are scriptures, guys. Three, he works all things after the counsel of his own will. He's working all these things for his own ends. And lastly, Psalm 103, his sovereignty rules over all. I wonder if God wants to expand our vision of his greatness. And the effects thereof will be greater praise, real feeling praise, praise felt, and a deeper bowing, a face to the carpet low, and a laying of your body down on the altar. Gladly, I gladly bow my knee. So this is the first part. He is incredible. So to believe what he has revealed about himself will not only produce faith and praise and adoration, but will be convicted of these facts. One, worry, worry is the seed of atheism. We'll be convinced of the fact that fear is an assault on God's character. We'll be convinced thoroughly that works are an insult to the gospel because it's God's work done for you. And lastly, we'll see that disobedience is pure insanity when we realize who God is. (laughs) Praise God. So we must remember who he is. Keep before our eyes the greatness of his name. But now the second point is, that's who he is. What is that person so great and grand, so sovereign and glorious and wise, omniscient, omnipresent. He is everywhere, right? He knows everything and omnipotent, has all power. What is that being like? In Exodus chapter 34, verse five, Moses says to God, I wanna know who you are. What, what is that? Where do I get that from? Saying, show me your glory. Is he saying, I wanna see what you're really like. I want to see you. I want to see your, the, the, the splendor and glory of your person. That's what I want to see. And God says to him a couple of things. One, he says, I'm going to let my goodness pass before you. I'm going to say my name to you. And lastly, I'm like this. He begins to describe himself. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So you see three things connected to the glory of God. So people ask, what, the, what, what is the glory of God? Well, ultimately, according to the scriptures, it is this. It is the name of the Lord. What is the glory of God? It is his nature. It is his goodness. What is the glory of God? It is seeing him as he has revealed himself to be. And Moses asks for this. And you know what happens right after this? He falls down on his face in worship. So you say, what is the second point? This great being, who he is, now what he's like. The scriptures show us that he is gracious and compassionate. If you were there last night, you heard me talk a little bit about compassion. Compassion is such an amazing word, especially when it's applied to a being such as God. Compassion means attraction to weakness. God, this great omnipotent power, is attracted to the weak, to the hurting, to the afflicted, to the broken, to those who can recognize they're blind. He comes to them. He's attracted to them. And he, 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 he bends his knee to feed them. My friend, Dane Ortland, I said this last night, he wrote a classic book called Gentle and Lowly. He said, the things about you, talking about the compassion of the Lord, the things about you that make you cringe most make him hug you tightest. What does that mean? What does that even say? It's revealing to you what this great being is actually like. Can you believe it? That such a great being, grand and glorious in control of all things. No one can thwart him. No one can challenge him. No one is comparable to him. Yet he goes like this. He comes down to where you are. I can't 
even believe it. He sees you in your weakness and you can't overcome this thing, your difficulty, and he bends down. He says, let me help you. Goodness gracious. Compassion, gracious. The scripture says that he loves you with an everlasting love. What's he like? He loves you with an everlasting love. He longs to shine his face upon your life. He puts joy in your heart more than the time when their corn and their wine increase. He longs for you and sings songs of love over you. He surrounds you with favor like a shield. He covers you with his pinions. He giddies your soul under the shadow of his wings. He satisfies your life with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. This is who we're talking about. This is what he's like. This great being, this is his character. The Bible says, forget none of his benefits. He pardons all your iniquities. He heals your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with loving kindness. He's slow to anger and he's rich in love. He doesn't deal with you as your sins deserve, praise God. And as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed your transgressions from you. Then as a father has compassion upon his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. (laughs) He remembers that we're dust and his loving kindness is everlasting and he keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. Who he is, what he's like. This doesn't make the heart want to leap and say, I will follow you wherever you go. If this doesn't make the soul say, I will worship you and give you my whole life. And then the last point that I have for you is what he has done. Well, this great omnipotent being, vast beyond finding out, wisdom beyond compare, making lightning for the rain, putting kings up and putting them down, making the sea dry with the breath of his mouth. This being has revealed what he's like, not just by saying I'm compassionate and saying he's gracious and dealing with people in the Old Testament in that way, but then the weight of love became so heavy that he dropped down out of heaven into the restrictions and the frailties of a human body so that he could look at them with eyes like theirs and breathe breath like them and speak to them as them. To be with them in their midst. He manifests his goodness and his kindness and his gentleness and his compassion in becoming a man. It's the height of the revelation of what he's like in Jesus Christ. Praise God. You know, when Moses says, show me your glory, God says, I'll show you, I'll tell you my name, I'll tell you my goodness, and I'll tell you what I'm like, I'll show you my nature. And he says, this is, this is my, my face, if you will, the face that, you can, that you're able to see at this time. But when Jesus comes, the scripture tells us, Paul has this revelation, that the glory of God has been unveiled in the face of Jesus Christ. What what does that mean? That means that the goodness of God has a face. It's Jesus Christ. (laughs) It means that the nature of God has a manifestation. It's Jesus Christ. It's that the glory of God has a face. It's the face of Jesus Christ. We see the full manifestation of what he is, what he's like in Jesus Christ, culminating by a twisted crown of thorns, too small in size, pressed in his brow and blood flowed in his eyes, blinds him to all but the prize. This is humility personified, the blood of God, not realizing though men love things that are deified, not a God that's crucified, but that's my God. He comes down and he dies. Oh, precious blood of him who loved me so. His hands are nailed, his head hangs low, his body's broken, his back is slashed open the splintering cross is soaked in blood oh what love and a love of me and I see his glory when his feet are upon the sea but never such glories when they're fastened to the tree the breath of life he breathes out his ghost and there's a dismayed angelic host with a naked God upon the post he's mostly red come down they said man's faith is dead but God bled for sin praise God say what are you trying to say I want to show how lovely he is I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would cast the stars of his charms with both hands to you so that those cold parts of love will come alive. Those cold coals will have the fire of God breathed upon them. That you will love him and say, there is no one like you. You are matchless and wonderful, perfect in every way. Praise God. Your mouth is truly full of sweetness and you are wholly desirable. And the final thing that I want to say to you is this. I read the, the life of Adolf Zafir. He is a Jew. He grew up in Budapest. 
He's a devout Jew. He knows the Bible, the Old Testament. He knows, knows nothing of the New Testament. And he learns of God. He loves God. He, he's seeing how God shows himself to Moses. He sees how God loves David. He sees God walking with Jacob. And he's saying, this God is so amazing. He creates all things. He can gather all this stuff from the Old Testament. And he's saying, man, this God of the Old Testament, this God of Israel is so amazing. And one day he's in a bookstore. And I think a book falls off the shelf. And the name of the book was God Became a Man. And when he saw that, he said, whoa, what a thought that this God of Moses, this God who I love seeing how he deals with David, this God who puts kings up and puts them down, this God that I read about and love so much in the Old Testament, wouldn't it be, what a a thought that he would become a man. And then one day he leaves, he just forgets, he moves on because it's like, that's, that's that's insane to a Jew. Then all of a sudden, somebody comes to him and begins to preach the gospel. And when they look at him and they say, you have to understand, the God of Israel was manifested in the flesh in Jesus Christ. Adolf Zafir bowed his knee to Jesus. And he said, if he's willing to come here for me, I've seen no greater love than this. I've seen no greater character than this. No greater goodness than this. I will gladly bow my knee and worship him. This is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God is making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. You say, Eric, why why did God send you here? Why am I here in this seat today? Why am I listening to your voice right now? I I think it's because that God wants to remind you of how great he is. I think it's because God wants to show you how good he is. And lastly, I think he wants to remind you of the great gospel. That your heart might fall head over heels in love with him. Praise God. Would you, would you pray for us? Lead us in a prayer. Would you? Just stand up. Stay standing. Lift your hands. Precious Jesus, let it be today that the Spirit causes a breaking of the limitations. Let it be today that our hearts are flooded with the reality of what you are as God. And from there, Lord, let it be that we are enlightened to see what your heart is like. And Lord, manifest it most perfectly in that man from Galilee who walked upon the sea. This man, so lovely and pure, adored, speaking the words of God, living a life we could never live, dying a death we deserve. Raising to life to pull us out of death, ascending on high to sit at the right hand of God as God and to send God the Holy Spirit into us. Lord, let us see it. Let us believe it by grace. Change us forever by the revelation of the gospel. Lord, I pray we'd never leave the gospel. We hold on to it with two hands because there isn't one thing a man can say that comes close to what we see in the gospel. Thank you, God. Make it real. Make us feel it. Let it vibrate in our bones. In your precious name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you were blessed and encouraged. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.